what's up guys, Pablo Munoz here. Welcome to this tutorial series where I'm gonna show you some really cool tips and tricks to texture a sci-fi asset in Substance 3D Painter. And I'm also gonna show you how to render that asset in Blender Cycles. Let's go ahead and jump straight into it. All right, so in this video, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview uh, and kind of like the setup of the whole thing so that you, you have an idea of the tools that I use and what we're gonna be aiming for. So this thing right here is the, the kind of like sci-fi blaster gun type of thing that we're gonna be uh, creating. So this is just the sketch that I did. And then I took that sketch and I modeled that in 3D. So this is the final 3D asset in uh, ZBrush. So this is the, the final model in ZBrush. And then I uh, created the bags and obviously the UVs and all of that for this and sent it to Painter. And these are the final textures that uh, we're gonna look into. And I'm gonna give you a breakdown of how I achieved some of these uh, textures in this blaster. And of course, this is a render from Blender Cycle. So I'm gonna show you uh, the simple but effective setup that I have for this type of assets. Now, on top of that, kind of like a, a bonus thing, I wanna show you how to do a more stylized render like this, uh, again, with textures from Painter. And we're gonna make use of one of the new tools or, or features that just got released recently in 3D Painter. So um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. All right, so this is the, the general overview. Now, aside from that, let me just go ahead and move this out of the way. Uh, this is the, the gun already in Painter. And I just wanna show you the, the setup in terms of the tools that I use. Now, let me just go ahead and switch to a different angle here. Uh, just because I want to show you the setup. So I work with a Cintiq 27 inch Pro uh, Touch and this, this screen right here, this monitor is actually a Cintiq and all the keys and everything are at the back. So if I put my hand here at the back, um, I have access to those keys and this is the pen that I use, right? So this is the Pen Pro. Uh, hopefully you, you can see here in the video, it has like three uh, different buttons. So the reason I'm showing you this is because for this specific software and any other software, I can map these buttons and these express keys here at the back to, to work comfortably. So I don't really need to use the, the keyboard. So I'm gonna show you the difference so that you can see the, the big improvement. So if I put this on the side here and I use, uh, this is my um, 3D mouse or, or vertical mouse. So if I use this to navigate, I need to rely on the keyboard. So I'm gonna press Alt key, middle mouse button, Alt key, right click to zoom in and out, rotate things around. Um, if I go into, let's say full screen, I can press the tab key. And that way I can work a little bit more comfortable here. Uh, so that these type of things become a, a bit more of second nature. So the reason again I'm showing you is because I can go ahead and set this up so that I don't need to rely on the keyboard and I can sort of like bring this closer to me. Uh, by the way, I'm also, let me see if I can show you this uh, from the back. Uh, that's a little bit hard to see, but I work with an ergo stand so I can just move this easily. So it's like an arm that I can just move this out of the way. So if I push this in, let me just do that. Uh, again, this is kind of like a, an extra thing before we get into the content, but I think it's important. So if I just go ahead and do that, uh, I can move this out of the way. I can take my pen here, and then I have my hand here at the back. Again, you can have keys on both sides if you want. So for instance, on my index finger, if I press the key here at the back, so I can just use this to go into full screen, and then I can use the keys on my left-hand side and the keys that I've mapped to this uh, to basically move things around like so and zoom in and out, right? So it makes the whole process a lot easier to zoom in and out. And I also have other keys mapped to, um, you know, if I need to do some painting. So let me just show you what that means. Again, this is more about like a, a general overview of what I'm gonna be using rather than the actual content. Uh, so if I go into layers, uh, I'm just gonna create a new painting layer just to show you. And that painting layer, don't worry, I'll cover this in just a bit. Uh, that painting layer is gonna be red. And that's it. So you see now that I have this um, brush. Actually, let me just switch quickly to the full screen here. Uh, so you see, this is the, the painting mode, right? And I'm navigating using the, the commands that I just showed you, right? So if I go ahead and paint like this, um, I have this brush size, but if I wanna change the brush size, that is done with the control key. So what I've done is that I map this key to my Cintiq as well. So again, let me go back in here. So if I press the control key, I can just go ahead and, sorry, not the, the shift key, Sorry, the shift key is to rotate the light around. And if I press the control key, I can change the brush size. So you see how that is changing. So all I'm doing is pressing control here at the back of my left-hand side, and then using the right click on the mouse, which I've mapped to the first one right here, to change the brush size. So I can do the same thing by pressing the shift key. So again, map to one of the, the fingers here in my Asyntic, and that allows me to change the lighting around. So with these commands, I can move I can rotate, I can zoom in and out, I can pan, I can click here to go into my full screen, change the lighting around to check that everything is working. Maybe go on this side here. Um, I wanna make like a small detail, for instance, in this area. So I can just hold the control key, right click, to reduce that. So that's the, the shortcut. So I can work with details. 
So I think this is very important in before we get into the tips and tricks so that you know you can see how I'm working um, so that it's a little bit more understandable how I, how I approach things in TechStream. So this is just to say that I map these things into the Cintiq. Um, there is actually a series of tips that I've created before for Wacom uh, where you can basically see what I've done. But very briefly, just to cover this, let me just switch to the full screen here. Um, this one right here is the Wacom Center. So what I've done is I selected my Pro Pen and you see I have the, um, the middle click, the, the right click, and the actual click or the left click mapped to this one. Uh, but you can do this based on the application. So if I click on Adobe Substance Painter, you see the difference between the all applications and Adobe Substance 3D Painter is that I have the Control, Alt, and right click. So I use this one to select a texture set as well. Um, and then if I go to Express Keys, this is kind of like the, the back of the Cintiq, what you can see here, right? Um, so you see, again, I have these all applications. I have different things. But if I click on Adobe Substance 3D Painter, the menu changes. And that is because I purposely change those things to work specifically for Painter. So um, for example, the, the full screen or tab, that's just basically click on this one and go into keyboard modifier, uh, not modifier, sorry, cancel that, uh, keyboard shortcut, that's what I meant. Um, and then you just press any keyboard that you need. And that way you can basically assign that to that section. So that makes it work a, a lot easier. The, the left hand side, which is the ones that I use the most, I have control shift and undo as well. Um, forgot to show you that. So one of the triggers, if I do all of these, I can just click on the trigger and go back. Uh, so I don't have to rely on the control Z. I just use the, um, the shortcuts. All right, and one more thing to cover, and this doesn't have to do with the Wacom specifically, but you might uh, see me rotate things around in a, in a smoother way. And I get this question quite a bit, so I'm just gonna cover very uh, briefly. So I use these, uh, this mouse right here, it's a Space Mouse Pro. I have um, a, you know, an entire breakdown of this as well in the, uh, in the YouTube channel, but this is the one that allows me to essentially uh, do this. Let me just let's show you what I what I mean. So so I can rotate things around as well um, in this way. But I just wanted to to show you in case that you know there's sections that will be easy for me to give you like a like a quick turntable um, like so. Uh, and that's the the reason why I'm showing you because I can do that with this device. But for the most part, I just use the um, the Wacom uh, setup that I just showed you to navigate and and to texture around. All right. So with that long introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and have some fun with this stuff. So I'm gonna delete that layer that I just created. And you see, I have a few uh, folders ready for you. Um, these are just pretty basic, but I wanna show you, oh, this is gonna be the first tip. So what I would recommend is to, when you get something um, like this, like an asset or even like a character, anything that you're going to texture that you have an idea what the materials are going to be like, or even if you wanna explore, but you have an idea which parts belong to each material. The first tip that I wanna give you is that it is ideal to group things together so that Whenever you put something in a folder that is part of the same group, then that material gets updated with whatever you do. So this is the number one thing that I do after I created all the bakes and, and I have the project ready to start texturing. So I go ahead and create a folder and I call this one uh, paint in this case. So this is gonna be a paint type of material. And let me just show you what that looks like. Um, I'm also gonna toggle off the mask just so you can see the, the paint. And if I open up the folder, it is super basic. It is a basic plastic or base plastic. And this is just a fill layer that has all the, the channels already uh, enabled. And of course, because this is meant to be a paint layer, I have certain things like the metal is set to zero. If I set this to one, it's obviously metallic. Um, the roughness, I just want to give it something that is not super shiny, something a bit more rugged or, or that feels like uh, a bit worn in, in that sense. Uh, but, but it is very, very basic, right? I don't have any additional effects. I don't have uh, high details or anything. It's just a base layer. And that's all I want to have. Now, the next thing I like to do is create a black mask. Uh, don't worry, I'll show you how to do that in just a second. But this mask will have a paint layer. And this paint layer allows me to select specific things on the model. And I just basically selected the areas that I think should be plastic or that I, I want it to be plastic, right? So if I bring in my final render here, you see that sort of black section remains the same. Obviously, it has more details and uh, wear and tear and all of that. But for the most part, all the sections that I selected are the plastic one. So it is a great way to uh, organize your projects before you get started. So that's pretty much what I've done here. Um, and then I just went ahead and did the same thing for all the different materials. So now I have a folder for each. And you see this is a nice block out that is very, very similar to the final render. There you go. So you see, um, 
It's exactly, exactly the same thing in terms of the blockout uh, and the colors. Obviously, the final result has a bit more refinement and, and the, the textures look a little bit more realistic in that sense, but they are very, very basic. So if you start this way, if you manage to block out the different materials in, in your project, in any project really, is going to speed up the workflow a lot more because you can concentrate on just defining the, the qualities of the texture and then assigning them to the different sections. So it makes it a lot more fun, uh, I think, and a lot easier. And it doesn't have to be just for a hard surface, uh, kind of like sci-fi gone like this. You can use these for characters. So you can have a folder for skin, a folder for leather, if it has some leather straps or something, uh, for fabric. Uh, it's just a matter of assigning those. So let me just show you what that looks like if I want to do a, a new one, right? I'm gonna go ahead and click on folder. It creates a new folder. Let's put that one here at the top. And let's call this one uh, fabric, right? I don't have any fabric on, on my asset, but just as, a, as an example, right? And then I'm gonna go ahead and click on black mask. So now that basically hides everything in this folder. Um, and then within the folder, we can just find, um, here in the started assets, I'm gonna type fabric and let's type this denim. So I'm gonna drag and drop that into my folder. So now, because I have the black mask on, this is masked out, so you don't see any difference. If I toggle the mask off, pressing the shift key, you see the, the effect of that mask. So I'm gonna go ahead and tile this so I can see more of that pattern. Um, so that's pretty cool, but I don't wanna have it everywhere, right? So that's when the masking comes into play. So I'm gonna enable that again by holding shift and clicking on the mask. And then from the mask, I'm gonna go to the magic one, add paint. And in here, you can start literally painting the areas that you want to have as, um, you know, as a denim in this, in this asset. But obviously that doesn't, um, that doesn't work for this, for this setup that we're doing. So what I like to do is click on this icon that allows me to select based on polygons. And here at the top, I'm gonna click on the third icon that allows me to select individual pieces, right? Or, or meshes that have um, continuity in the topology. So that means that if I wanna make, uh, let's say this thing here at the top, I can just click on that. And all of that section is now uh, fabric. I can do the same thing, let's say for this sort of handle and this tube, and maybe this part here at the bottom, and maybe some of the, this tiny, uh, screws, right? So I can really quickly isolate all of those things and then now becomes part of my mask. So if I hold the Alt key to access the mask, you see the white areas are the only sections that this uh, denim or fabric is coming through. So this, again, it might seem like a very simple basic thing to do, but if you organize your project like this by folders and defining what are the materials that you're going to work on um, later on, it makes it really, really simple. And it doesn't have to be uh, set it in stone. If I want to change this to something else, let's go uh, type metal, right? I'm going to make it gold now. So I'm going to drop it into the folder and then I'm going to delete the one that I had in fabric. And because again, it is already masked out, all of the things change in here. So it makes it really, really easy. You can go ahead and add maybe some rust in that material. And then you can also within the folder itself, let's give it a color so you know all of the ones that are part of that folder. Um, you can take the rust that sits on top of the metal, create a black mask, paint layer, and then you can literally, uh, let's go with the paint. You can start painting the areas that are rust, um, but you know, it's only gonna be limited to the sections that are within this mask in the folder. So as a quick summary, just create folders and create you know, mask so that you can work on the materials and the quality of the materials. And that way you don't have to worry about where those materials are going to be and how they're gonna blend. Now, one important thing that I wanna show you is that because I use, I use this tool here to select the polygon fill, right? So if I click on this one, uh, it selects those entire objects. That is because they're actually separate objects. So let me just show you again in ZBrush this time. So this is the final asset, right? Uh, but all of these pieces are actually separate. So if I enable Polyframe and do something like that, let's go into the lowest subdivision here. Um, it is not like this super optimized game asset that you would expect. It is it's actually a concept. So um, this is the low res mesh, which is actually pretty high res. Uh, but you know, all of these pieces are individual. So if I hold control and shift to isolate uh, this top bit, this is that single piece, right? So that is why in Painter, it allows me to essentially select different pieces because there is no continuity. And on that note, and just to wrap up this initial overview of the project, um, I wanna show you that the way that I bake these things from the low res and the high res mesh were by exploding the mesh. So I took all of these pieces apart. So I hold control and shift, selected that, control to um, mask this area, and then I just move that thing like so. So I did that multiple times with all the pieces and I ended up with this sort of like exploded mesh uh, that has enough space in between to bake everything, oops, sorry, <laughs> that bake everything um, nicely. And then I can just go ahead and export these, do the bakes, and then re-import 
this asset into Painter and it will have all the nice bakes. All right, so that is pretty much it in terms of the setup and the things and the tools that I'm gonna be using. And obviously the first tip, which is organizing the project, which I think is absolutely um, necessary to get that right from the beginning. All right, so that's it for this introduction of the project. Hopefully this gives you a, a rough idea of what we're gonna be doing. And in the next video, we're gonna jump into the more practical stuff. I'll see you there.